Christy's going to come and share a word with us, but I wanted to start out with a couple of things really quick. I had um, the scripture has been burning in my heart. It's Jeremiah 24, and it says, I will give them a new intense desire to know me because I am the eternal one. They will be my people and I will be their God because they will return to me completely. I just want to cast just a prophetic declaration over this word that that God wants God is sending this out I believe because he is wanting people to completely return to his original design for things. One of the things that right now is going on is a is a restructuring of this country and you need you need to really understand that that the enemy loves to deceive and distort and he does that so that we will basically chase after on a rabbit trail for two months 20 years down some road to just discover that isn't have you ever heard someone say something you know i i i talked about it i think this year about the cicadas and i always thought that those were locusts remember and i don't know if you know but there was an invasion of cicadas over a certain plane recently and you know i love what kat kerr says she says that when god doesn't put somebody in a position that god is spending basically my paraphrase of what she said that they don't have his authority in that position and so, you know, when I was reading that about the cicadas and realizing that, that's, I said that right, right? And realizing that that's not even what they were called, then that began to make me think, wow, some things that I thought were called certain things, some things that I thought were a certain way, that I don't know if y'all remember me talking about that, but that was the day I was telling you he was going to mess you up. Y'all maybe thought it was just about me and the cicadas, but it was about you. You just missed that instruction that he was coming to forget some of your sacred cow. So as Christy comes, then let's welcome her, and she's going to talk to us about this word. Hello. Hi. Well, I didn't really know I was going to be doing this today, but right before we started service, it became apparent that I was. So it really made a lot of things make sense because I've been feeling this um, sensation in the atmosphere of this kind of pushback. And I could really tell this time that it really wasn't personal for me. And it was it seemed a little bit different for me. It seemed like something that was rather than being really up close, it was farther away. And it just, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of break it and then it'll come back. And it's kind of been persisting in, a, in an odd way. So I realized um, while we were in the green room, what I think's going on is it feels very similar to when like Tisa and I have a word to share on a Sunday morning. We'll sometimes feel this thing in the atmosphere that's like pushed back from the enemy to, to, for us to, you know, not share the message just to put it simply. Well, this was sort of similar, but it, like I said, it was something different about it. And it is going, um, extending over a longer period of time. And so I realized that what I think that I'm feeling is this um, pushback from the enemy about what God is doing himself at this point in time. Um, specifically today, leading up to today, there's been several um, prophets that felt in their spirits that there was some sort of major thing that was going to happen in America or in the world with all of what's on God's agenda, okay, not man's agenda, but what's on God's agenda, all that's going on, that there was something going to happen. And um, in fact, uh, I heard uh, Johnny Enlow said that, you know, the 4th, 4th of July was for the day for the church to go forth, come forth, step, go forth and step into your, your position. So there's lots of prophetic words out there. And I've been sensing too, that, um, this, that there is a shift taking place in what God's doing right now. Um, that, and I think that's what this pushback feeling is the, um, you know, there's been this season of time where I believe God has been allowing, um, a lot of evil in the world to be exposed. 
And that's why we're seeing this huge influx of all sorts of insanity going on in the world. And and so I believe that um, there's been this period of time where he's allowing it to be exposed for a reason. But um, I've, there's something that's shifting, and I think this is what's happening right now. There's a time that I feel like God was allowing people who are participating with evil um, to repent. He was calling them to repentance. And then there's also this period of time for the church, for the body of Christ, to make a decision about where they're going to stand, you know, how they're going to respond to what's going on. Really, essentially, are you either are you with me or are you against me? And so that really that goes across the board for all people. It's either, you're either in the body of Christ or you're oblivious to what's going on and you're unknowingly participating in other agendas um, or you're just knowingly participating in evil and furthering that. And so there was this period of time where I feel like he was allowing people a chance to repent, but he's shifting. I believe he's shifting now and he's taking action he's taking changing his personal stance so god himself i believe is changing his stance and he's moving into some sort of action right now and i feel very strongly that he is not um, this is the type of thing where he's like i'm moving no one can stop it you're either with me or you're against me so you had your chance to repent you had your time to decide where you're going to stand but now is the moment and so I feel like he's doing something. He's pushing something into action right now. And so, um, so this word that I have, it kind of makes more sense to me now with that in mind that um, that all trickles down to all of us, right? Like, how are we going to respond to what he's doing right now? Are we going to be with him? Are we going to be against him? Are we lukewarm? Are we tangled up in our own stuff still? All of that. So... Um, excuse me, I wanted to start off with um, reading the word that's on the handout that we, about real freedom in America. And if you remember, the, um, this all started with a dream. I'm going to have to find it on here. Let's see. Okay, so basically, a um, short version of this is it all started, I had a dream back on um, June 12th, and I had a dream that basically there was this man and this woman, and they had this love connection, and then there was something that took place that took the woman into captivity, and so then the man started pursuing the woman, and Tessa mentioned this earlier, but the woman's name was America. I knew that in the dream. Her name was America. So in the dream, he was trying to chase after her and find her because she'd been taken into captivity. And then, but by the time he got to her, um, she had already passed away. And, but they, her, their baby had been born. And so his pursuit then changed to free the baby. And then the dream shifted and basically um, represented multiple generations after that period of time pursuing that same goal rescue the baby, take them out of captivity. Like there was this something about restoring the connection, a love connection that was interrupted by this captivity. But what was interesting in the dream is that by the end of the dream, multiple generations in, somehow the goal had been, was a little bit of a twisted version of its original design. And I knew in the dream that it wasn't quite right anymore and so that led me to question what, you know, what are you saying, Holy Spirit, and how does this relate to what we're, what's going on right now? Because obviously the girl's name was America, so this must have to do with our nation. And I don't have, I didn't have any particular personal thing going on um, that I was, you know, especially passionate about. This just came, dropped in from the Holy Spirit. So... So I wrote this word, and I'm going to go ahead and read it, and then I'm going to point out a few things, and I've got an, an add-on to it um, for what he showed me yesterday. So I've started this process of asking the Holy Spirit, um, what was the original goal? Since in the dream it showed that the original goal had kind of been twisted and had gotten a little bit off. So I began in this word where I was writing, and I said, how did this all begin? 
speaking of the country of America, did it start with an invitation, with a plan? Was it for com commerce, for religion, or just some good old fashioned freedom? I sense it was more than this. I sense it was more than just man's plan, more than just a way to make a better day, more than just a way to do it our own way. What plan of man existed without divine intervention anyway? Who planted hope in the hearts of men? Who stirred up dreams for greater scenery? Who stirred up the desire to expand? Wasn't it always him? So then when does the time come for us to ask what he had in mind with all of this? When do we stop and ask why he initiated all of it? We're so quick to remember our own desires, our own motives. It's so easy to add them as fuel to the fire. But when do we tap into what sparked it all to begin with? When do we ask him what lit the fire inside of him? We are so captivated by our own ideals and visions that we fail to remember that there's one with an original plan. Do we elevate our own motives above his? Do we claim to worship him but fail to exalt him above the plans and ways of men? Do our forefathers bear more weight than him? Who decided what this nation was for? Who decided what this temple should look like? Are we a nation of idols or a nation of temples? Are we billboards for humanity or temples for his exalting? Perhaps we've gotten things out of order. Perhaps we've mistaken the means from the end. Methods and motives are two separate things. I sense that we've mistaken one for the other, or perhaps we've even forgotten to care about motive. So I said, Holy Spirit, come and show us what started it all. Show us the original why in the heart of the Father. Help us become children intent on his pleasure. With this one thing in mind, realign our hearts and the hearts of those in this nation with your original desire. When we stand, let it be on the conviction of his original desire. When we pray, let our words be expressions of what he had in mind. Let us as a nation say together, not our will, but yours. May humility Clear the way for f the freedom you desire. Let us not just repent for what we've allowed or mistakenly followed, but also for forgetting the why in the heart of the Father. And he said, my beloved, once again, it all started with a walk in a garden. I felt the heart of true desire for me and made a way for it to spread its wings. Over and over, man has restricted the growth of this one thing. It's not so different than the journey of each individual. Nations and man, men and nations, just different expressions of the same manifestation. How much freedom of my expression do you allow in yourself? I want you to remember that question, okay? How much freedom of my expression do you allow in yourself? Do you allow me to express my divinity, my desires, my delights in you personally? Or do you restrict and regulate for fear of making a mistake? Nations and man, men and nations, just different levels of the same manifestation. I saw true freedom begin to have expression and made a place for it to expand. Not the freedom of man, but freedom for my expression. He said, this nation wasn't created to free man. This nation wasn't created to free them from their restraints or religious persecution. This nation was created for my expressions to freely expand. You see, I saw hearts opening and taking my hand. They met me in the garden instead of the building. They took my hand and began to stay longer than they'd originally planned. 
they opened their hearts to my expressions within and found new meaning to life, to liberty, to love's original intent. Room was made, time was spent, hearts began to expand, and I knew it was time to breathe on this. So I made a way, I chose the place, and I established a nation in a brand new way. He said, it's, it was so fresh and new with room for so many to have a good view. The very notion of freedom became a brand. The United States of America took shape and man began to capitalize on the only thing feeble minds can understand of freedom. They sold it, built on it, promoted it, farmed it, and harvested great fame. Notoriety grew of what they could gain, and definitions of freedom were put in place. Freedom became the mascot, the commercial banner waved over this great nation that I made. But capital gains and the power discovered in what just two hands could make blinded them from the main thing. They forgot the garden forgot our walks. They forgot the desire for me that they'd once felt. They made no place for me in their definition of freedom. This limited definition of freedom was focused only on what man could freely gain. Freedom came to mean what no longer bound a man. But you see, this freedom was originally designed for me for my full expression to have room to expand, for my delights and desires to take shape within the hearts of man, for my love and passion to flow without restraint or regulation. What no longer bound a man ended up binding me. He went on to say self-expression, self-awareness, self-made self-confidence, self-esteem, self-sufficiency, self-worth, self-pity, self-righteousness, self-defense, self-help, self-restraint, self-sustaining, self-determination, self-consciousness, self-talk, self-centeredness, just to name a few, is what began to grow in this definition of freedom. You see, I'd already set man free. Man wasn't in need of freedom. I was. It's man's overexpression and captivation with itself that binds me over and over again. When divinity is bound by its own creation, Chaos and destruction ensues. It's not my doing or my wish. It's the result of natural disorder. Man exalted above divinity will always impede life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He says that true freedom will return to this nation when hearts and minds return to the desire for my freedom of expression. True freedom and prosperity will return in and through those who exalt my freedom above their own. I say again, nations and man, men and nations, just different expressions of the same manifestation. How much freedom of my expression do you allow in yourself? Do you allow me to express my divinity, my desires, my delights in you personally? Or do you restrict and regulate for fear of making a mistake? Nations and man, men and nations, just different levels of the same manifestation. The nation goes as you go. It changes with you. It changes when men decide to make room for my freedom of expression within them. On the 4th of July this year, 
Let Independence Day return to my original intent. Shout of my independence from the suppression and restraints within man. Celebrate my freedom of expression in the hearts of man. When the cry goes out to let freedom ring with all your heart, shout, make way for the king. That's it. That's right. Make way for the king. So there's some additional information at the end of that word, but um, if you don't mind, just take a look at that later. I'm going to go over some of the scriptures that we shared, but some some fun facts. Um, the America, My Country, Tis of Thee song um, was first written in 1831, and it used to be one of the um, national anthems, like a de facto national anthem of the United States for, uh, well, 100 years, really, it was. Um, and the first, this really stood out to me, the very first perf- time it was ever performed was on July 4th at a Children's Independence Day celebration at Park Street Church in Boston. So highlighted for you there are the first time it was performed. Its original intent was by children, the childlike, the people with the childlike hearts, and a church, it's the body of Christ, submitted, who knows who their father is, that sang this. And we included the lyrics there that include, of course, let freedom ring. But if you look at, the, at all of the words, it's all, it says, our fathers, God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. So, of course, it's, it's um, all pointing back to his original intent for this country, and that was mind-blowing to me. I'd never thought about it. I've never thought about it that way before, that this country was really established by him. His purpose was for his freedom, for his freedom of expression in us. So I, as I, when I, I woke up early, really early yesterday, the Holy Spirit woke me up like at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I was um, kind of went into this, a battling type of prayer. And when I felt this um, opening came up, I found myself reading again in Romans 14, um, which I shared just a couple days ago, I think a couple services ago. Um, but Romans 14 is where um, we shared the other night when we were talking about faith. But in verse 23, it says, but the one who has misgivings feels miserable if he eats meat because he doubts and doesn't eat in faith. For anything that we do that doesn't spring from faith is, by definition, sinful. So that was a really powerful verse, and it really opened my eyes, and I've been pondering on it. And so I went back to that yes on Saturday and uh, was wanting to just ponder on that more and go a little deeper with it. So I read earlier in, the, in that same chapter and you can see if you if you go to Romans 14 that they're basically debate. Uh, Paul is trying to address the fact that some people feel like they can eat meat, some people feel like they shouldn't eat meat, and what do you do when you're a body of believers who have these different beliefs, even? And so I was reading a little bit more about that, and it it struck me that what some of these believers, so these are all Christians who have different approaches to their Christianity, to the freedom that God's given them. And it stood out to me that some of the people were, it was because of the past life that they had come out of, that they'd been freed from, that kind of influenced their their stance. So for example, some of the Christians who they'd been told it was okay to eat meat, well, they didn't want to eat meat because meat was associated with their the pagan Uh, rituals and sacrifices. And so that was a little bit too close to home for them, and they just wanted to keep away from that. And so that got me thinking about present day. Well, we all have these issues in the world right now, right, where humanity is all up in arms about the things that they feel are right and wrong. You know, that this should not be, this should, this should be, and everybody is all worked up. There's all sorts of people offended about it, and and people are fighting for all of these rights on both sides of the fence. And I'm not saying that there shouldn't be, that process shouldn't be, but it 
it occurred to me that we sound present day like these people did in Romans, where they were debating amongst each other about whether they could eat meat or couldn't eat meat. And it had become such a big issue that he's devoted almost a whole chapter. Paul had to devote almost a whole chapter to, look, here's how you handle this. You know, first of all, you're not supposed to even be the ones judging each other and basically don't cause your your brother or sister to stumble and to respect each other. Um, So there's a whole other message there, of course. But it made me think, how did we get here? Because that's a real that's a far cry from the original freedom. You know, so if you if if these are all believers, so they were saved, they were experienced salvation, they experienced the grace that Jesus died to give them, and yet they're debating and they're all entangled in this issue, these issues that are that God says are not even important. And so uh, it really made me think about present day, and I decided I was just go back to Romans one and start reading there because. I wanted to see, I I just kept backing further and further up. I was like, well, how did we get here? How did they get to the point where they were debating about this kind of stuff? So it was really interesting. I found myself reading in Romans 1 and feeling like it is exactly explains what's going on in the world right now. And ultimately, I heard the Holy Spirit highlighting something for us that goes along with the word we just read about real freedom and uh, about God himself having real freedom. So in Romans 1, first I want to read verse 5. It says, through him, through Jesus, grace cascaded into us, empowering us with the gift of apostleship so that we can win people from every nation into the obedience that comes from faith to bring honor to his name. And you are among the chosen ones who are called to belong to Jesus, the anointed one. So that's our real purpose. That was the original purpose, right? Not to argue with each other about what's right or wrong. So just remember, grace, we have been empowered with grace. A little further down, right before verse 18. I love the title that the message used right before going into this section, they chose to call it ignoring God leads to a downward spiral. (laughs) Right? The message just tells it like it is. Now in verse, uh, right before that, in that section, verse 16, Paul says, I refuse to be ashamed of the wonderful message of God's liberating power unleashed in us through Christ. And again, that is the position that we have got to take. We have got to refuse to be ashamed of the wonderful message of God's liberating power. Liberating. It was for the purpose that was already set up there in verse 5. for To be empowered by grace, to bring liberty, and to, to bring honor to his name, and to bring other people into freedom. So in verse 18, it talks about, it says, for God in his, and I'm reading in the Passion Translation, for God in heaven unveils his holy anger, breaking forth against every form of sin, both toward ungodliness that lives in hearts and evil actions. For the wickedness of humanity deliberately smothers the truth and keeps people from acknowledging the truth about God deliberately smothers. Now that sounded an awful lot like the restriction that he was talking about in the word about real freedom. The wickedness of humanity deliberately smothers the truth. I looked it up in the Greek and it is actually is another word for suppresses. And so when we suppress God's expression within us, we are participating in smothering the truth within us. And that keeps people from acknowledging the truth about God. In verse 19, it says that in reality, the truth of God is known instinctively, for God has embedded this knowledge inside every human heart. We've, we've read this verse before here and talked about it. And so how incredible it is that before we were even born, God's, God had already impressed upon us and embedded the knowledge of who he is and what pleased him already in our hearts. That's even before salvation. It was written on our hearts. 
So our true original design for as human beings was we came prepackaged with the knowledge of who he is, of wanting a desire to please him and what pleased him. So you go to verse 21, though, and it says throughout human history, the fingerprints of God were upon them, yet they refused to honor him as God or even be thankful for his kindness. Doesn't that sound like what we just read? What, and he himself said in that word about America, his intention. They refuse to honor him as God and, they, and even be thankful for his kindness. Instead, they entertained corrupt and foolish thoughts about what God was like. Now remember in that previous verse, it said that if we suppress or suffocate out the truth, then the people will not be able to acknowledge who God really is. So you can see just this is the result of that. They refused to honor him as God, and um, they entertained corrupt and foolish thoughts about what God was like. This left them with nothing but misguided hearts steeped in moral darkness. The footnote there in the Passion Translation says they became futile, futile in their reasoning. That means powerless. That means it's you're going nowhere in their reasoning and their thinking. So what I was noticing here is that God had already pre-written, he'd pre-touched our hearts with all of this information of the knowledge of who he is. But the suppression of that created a response in us that was to go, that led us further astray. So I'm thinking that, I guess you could say that in the, um, the way I see it is that you know, people don't really start off and say, today I'm going to wake up on Monday, I'm going to go out and I'm going to be a, a proponent for evil. And I'm just going to dive in all the way, just going to dive in full force and I'm going to be the most evil person I can be. They don't, you know, I wasn't on Friday, but Monday I'm going to work and that's what I'm doing. That's not really how it happens. It's, it starts with these small, subtle decisions. It started here. He's telling us how, what happened in humanity. We came pre-impressed, pre-embedded within us, the knowledge of who he is and what pleased him, and we suppressed it. We suppressed it. And so our response led to this downward spiral. That's why the message called it that. So they refused to honor him as God or even be thankful for his kind kindness that led to corrupt and foolish thoughts about what God was like and left them with nothing but misguided hearts steeped in moral darkness. Does that not sound like present day culture? Verse 22 says, although claiming to be wise, they were in fact shallow fools. In the footnote there, it says that the Aramaic can be translated, they became insane. So that small decision about how we were going to respond to what God had already pre-written on our hearts, that initial decision quickly led to this being displayed in humanity, becoming insane a futile mentality, and, and operating in insanity. Verse 23 says, For only a fool would trade the truth of God for a lie. And that's what he just described happened in our country. When he first made the country, people traded the truth of God for a lie of what they could do on their own and what freedom really meant, how much they could prosper from it, how much they could sell it, all of that. They traded the truth of God. That's exactly what he said in that word. It says that they worshiped and served the things God made rather than the God who made all things. Again, it's exactly what he said. God said he established this nation for a purpose. He made it. He set it up for freedom, for real freedom. And they worshiped what he made rather than the, than himself. They worshiped freedom. That's why he said it became a brand. It became a mascot. It became a billboard and a marketable item. Instead of what it really, uh, instead of worshiping him, they worshiped the notion of freedom for man. You jump down to verse uh, 28. It says, because they thought it was worthless to embrace the true knowledge of God. Does that also sound like present day? We've got people in our government boldly saying that on camera to the entire nation. 
blatantly. It's thought it was worthless to embrace the true knowledge of God. So it says that God gave them over to a worthless mindset to break all rules of proper conduct. conduct. He gave them over to it. I want to propose to you that, that this is the process that God does, and we've, we've heard about this before, but he says, I've already imprinted this on you, but in your, in your small decision of how you were going to respond to what I already gave you, what I already told you, in your little decision, you don't know where this road is leaving, but you, you took a left when you should have turned right, so I'm going to take my hand off of you and let you see where the road going to the left is going to go, where it's going to take you. Because we humanity, I'm, I'm saying that we don't see the long-term results. We think that these little decisions are innocent decisions that have no impact, but they're actually very, very valuable and powerful. So God gave them over to a worthless mindset to break all rules of proper conduct. Their sinful lives became full of every kind of evil. Again, I'm just trying to paint a correlation here between where we are in this country and in this world. It sounds like a description of exactly where we're at, what's going on. Their sinful lives became full of every kind of evil, wicked schemes, greed, and cruelty. Their hearts overflowed with jealous cravings and with conflict and strife, which drove them into hateful arguments and murder. They are deceitful liars, full of hostility. They are gossips who love to spread malicious slander. With inflated egos, they hurl hateful insults at God. Yet they are nothing more than arrogant boasters. They are rebels against their parents and totally immoral. They are senseless, faithless, ruthless, heartless, and completely merciless. Although they are fully aware of God's laws and proper order, and knowing, and knowing that those who do all of these things really deserve to die, yet they still go headlong into darkness, encouraging others to do the same and applauding them when they do. That sounds like our present day culture, without a doubt. It was interesting because one of the footnotes in there, it says that the Aramaic can tra be translated when it says they're senseless, faithless, ruthless, heartless, and completely merciless. It says that can be translated as meaning they have no stability in themselves, neither love nor peace nor compassion, no stability. And I just want to throw in here that it was noticeable to me that <clears throat> this emphasis on love in these last few weeks, the Holy Spirit has been highlighting and just bringing us back around to this emphasis on love. I noticed in my notes the day that I that I received that word from him on America, on real freedom, that the my day started off with these lines that we worked into a song that day called, I think we called it the Feast on Love. But it, the first lines I heard that day was, I sense the heart of a father. I sense the heart of a lover. I sense the heart of a passionate pursuer. And that song became our Feast on Love song that we presented, I think, the next day. And then, of course, on Wednesday night, all of a sudden, we have this Holy Spirit-led song of, I know you're going to sing me a love song. <clears throat> And so now we've been on faith and we've been on obedience and we've been on all these topics, but it's like he just keeps coming in and saying, I'm going to paint love over that. Don't forget about love. Love is the ultimate equate part of the equation. It's how it started at all, which takes me back to the dream that I had, which it was started with a love connection, which is why uh, Tessa's word was so cool about today being a wedding day. In my dream, it ultimately was culminating in a wedding it's because it has all been about this passionate pursuit about love, between a love connection between God and his people. Yeah. And that, that, what would, that the intention, the whole thing that was birthed from that was this country of America. <clears throat> so, let me find where it was back in Romans.
So if you read on, if you continue to read in Romans 2, it just still talks about how the riches of his extraordinary kindness make you take him for granted and despise him. Haven't you experienced how kind and understanding he's been to you? Don't mistake his tolerance for acceptance. Do you realize that all the wealth of his extravagant kindness is meant to melt your heart and lead you into repentance? The footnote there in the Aramaic, it says the Aramaic can be translated. Do you not know that it is the fulfillment of God to bring you blessings? The fulfillment of God to bring you blessings. But those governed by selfishness and self-promotion, again, does that not sound like what he just said in the word, right? Governed by selfishness and self-promotion, whose hearts are unresponsive, to God's truth and would rather embrace unrighteousness will experience the fullness of wrath. Now, wrath is a strong word in my book and that some, for a lot of people, invokes the idea of a really angry God. But I loved the commentary and the voice talks about how um, God's wrath isn't something that's just coming one day. It's that it's already at work in the world and it is effectively God's hands off policy. So when it said earlier, remember the verse that I read, he said he, he gave them over to a worthless mindset. He took his hands off and said, okay, this is the road you've chosen. I'm going to show you where this is going. And so we experience with sin in our lives, we experience um, not just, a, we don't just get in trouble for our sins. We experience all sort of negative consequences because we're sowing seeds into our lives when we do things that are against God and are are not pleasing to him. So again, when he's talking about we'll experience the fullness of wrath, I would propose that that's happening right now. So those governed by selfishness and self-promotion whose hearts are unresponsive to God's truth and would rather embrace unrighteousness will experience the fullness of wrath. Interestingly, it says in just the very next verse, I believe, and further down 16, verse 16, so this judgment will be revealed on the day when God, through Jesus the Messiah, judges the hidden secrets of people's hearts. So he is saying that there's a consequence, there's a sowing and a reaping of the decisions that we make present day that we're going to experience from sinning, from doing things that are unrighteous. But there is a judgment day coming also. And so the, tra- the Passion Translation's uh, verbiage is really interesting. So this judgment will be revealed on the day when God, through Jesus the Messiah, judges the hidden secrets of people's hearts and their response to my gospel will be the standard of judgment used in that day. Their response that takes us back to the beginning. They smothered and suppressed his truth and his writing on their heart. That was their choice of response to him. So he's saying here that what's how we choose to respond to what God says present day is the standard by which we're going to be judged. Now I want to propose to you all that the majority of you are probably thinking this doesn't apply to me because I'm living a righteous life and I've, I've given everything to him and I, my life is fully about him. But I want to propose to you that he's highlighting this to us, to this family, to this tribe for a reason. He's highlighting the importance of our response to him. Are we going to smother the truth that he gives us or are we going to partner with it? So just saying, don't think that none of this applies to you yet. In verse 22, it says that you say, I hate idolatry and false gods. Listen to this. This is talking to us. You say, I hate idolatry and false gods, but do you withhold from the true God what is due him? Do you withhold from the true God what is due him? 
as I said, we are all, we, all this house is really about letting the Holy Spirit lead and have his way and have his voice sp- spoken through us and yielding to that. So we're not talking about, most of us in here, we're not talking about blatant sins or unrighteous living. But he's saying something to you that you guys have said, you have valued my voice. You said you worship me, but do you really exalt my voice above the other systems in your life? Do you really? Do you really exalt me and my voice over the things that you're, that you are the other systems that you're still partnering with? For example, if you are like me, you really love peace. Peace is really important. And you find things in your life, like a lot of introverts do. We find structures and systems that create peace, you know? It's like, well, I like to be, I have a routine. I like to be at bed at this time. I don't do this on Mondays or, you know, I, um, all these rules, you know, about how to maintain and protect our peace. That in itself isn't bad, but when the Holy Spirit asks you to do something that's against one of those things, which, which one do you yield to? When he interrupts one of the systems that you have in place. Now that could be for your provision, for your peace, for your security, for validation, all sorts of reasons. So we have systems that we, and he's been telling this this for a while, but there are things in operation in us that we could take a closer look at. and, And we could see that we are not responding to him in that way because we're still honoring that old system. In verse 28, it says, you are not a Jew if it's only superficial. Let's just replace that here with you're not uh, just a Christian. You're not a, a, you know, Jesus loving, Holy Spirit following a Christian if it's only superficial. For it's more than just the surgical cut of a knife that makes you Jewish. Jewish, but you are Jewish because of the inward act of spiritual circumcision, a radical change that lays bare your heart. It's not by the principle of the written code, but by power of the Holy Spirit. For then your praise will not come from people, but from God himself. We are often, I think a lot of us as Christians are really into the behavior modification. So we, maybe we know, you know, we're not supposed to judge each other. So we keep our mouth shut and we don't say things to the people that we're judging. So it doesn't come out. Right. But inwardly, we're still just judging. And he's saying here that does, that's only superficial. It's an inward act. And so the Holy Spirit, I believe, is really asking us, he's saying that this is a season where he is about to move and he is on the move and he is going to transform this country, which is going to transform the world. And we're entering into a kingdom age where his glory is going to be revealed. It's going to flow through us if we are ready, if we will yield to him. He's pointing out to us that there's some fine tuning, some tweaking in us that we could really do Stand to do. We don't want to just be superficial. And it is going to make a difference of whether or not we are in his way or we get to stay, go with him. And he's saying to the body of believers that there are believers who are in my way. And we are going to either be in his way or we're going to help fuel his momentum. We're going to give him more momentum on the earth. And so I know this is a really a deep, uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying, suggesting that we go, we all go away and look a little deeper at this about what's really going on in our hearts. But we all have areas that we can do this and that we could come up higher in this. And so I wrote a little bit yesterday um, that it was our response in the beginning to what was pre-written on our hearts that led us astray and further entangled us in a life governed by self, separated by his, from his presence, overflowing with evil and darkness. It was our response in the beginning. Again, a subtle response. It was God whispering to you. So just like now when you hear the Holy Spirit say, hey, buy that person's lunch, and you shut it down, it was that level. 
That's what I'm saying. That level led to the condition of the world in our nation right now. That's putting it bluntly, blatantly. That level. When we don't, when we shut him down and we say, I'm going to shove that to the back and I'm not going to partner with you. I'm not going to give that any voice and I'm going to do my own thing because I'm more comfortable in that because in reality, I actually worship this other system. That has led us to the way the condition of the world right now, it's spelled out in Romans 1. It's spelled out for us why we're here. So wouldn't it make sense to us right now to value our response to him now in the middle of our journey? In the middle of this, we know we're also going to be judged at the end of our life on judgment day. We're going to be judged by the very same thing, our response to him. The res- our responses in present day are re- the standard by which we're going to be judged in the future by how well we responded to his message. And so what if that meant more than just saying, yes, I receive you as Lord and Savior? What if our response to the gospel was more than just that salvation message, but was more about a person's lunch? I spoke. I, the God of all creation, spoke to you. What is your response going to be? Even if it seems like a small and subtle thing. Wouldn't it make sense for us to increase the value of our responsiveness to him right now? When we see the condition of our nation, of the world around us, and we know the connection between it and humanity's responsiveness to God, shouldn't it lead us to break off everything, everything that hinders the purity of our responsiveness to him? For some, that may mean to stop discounting his voice. For some, that may mean stepping out in courage to act on what his voice is saying, rather than just holding it as a notion or a concept. For some, that may mean being honest with yourself about what is really fueling your drive to speak or act out in response to his voice. Is there purity of motive in your response, or is there a self-driven ambition also in the works? And I heard the Holy Spirit saying this. He said, allow what flows to flow and to flow in purity. It's very simple. Allow what flows to flow and to flow in purity. He is flowing. The Holy Spirit is flowing. He said, pull back the self-imposed floodgates. Stop trying to manage the flow of my spirit as if it's an unruly child that must be tamed. Stop restricting my flow out of fear. Stop trying to manage me like you've managed yourself. I am in you, but I am not you. I have a purity of presence that exists within you, but is separate from your soul. I am a pure voice that is ready to flow. I have a fluid movement, a rhythm, and a pulse. I am not asking you to shape me or shape my borders. I am asking you to allow me to shape you. This thing of careful balancing of your soul and spirit is not the path for my glory to flow. Your soul must be submitted to your spirit, submitted to my spirit. It is not your soul's job to manage your spirit. So many of you have only known strength of soul, and now you try to use it to manage the flow of your spirit with mine. Your soul is not the source of your strength. Although it may be all that you've ever known, given the chance, you will experience the greater thing. There's no peace like that of a fully submitted soul. Now, this was hilarious, but I swear this is what the Holy Spirit said. Why keep driving that Flintstone car when a hovercraft is waiting to take you higher? (laughs) Isn't that the perfect picture? We're trying to use our soul. We're like, you know, running with our feet on the ground or a little bare feet on the ground to get some momentum. That's our soul. He has a hovercraft, a hovercraft waiting for us. That's the, that's the contrast. 
He said, don't minimize the importance of this hour. I am calling you higher. I am increasing my flow. Your responsiveness to me will determine the level at which you will flow with me. What I am currently pouring out cannot be contained and will not be restricted or tainted in any way. Don't underestimate the importance of this hour. We've got to take this seriously. You know, we're, we're mostly good people. We're good people. We're living righteous lives. But he's telling us this for a reason. Again, we have got to recognize the ways that we are suppressing the truth of who God is. It's on the level that I've already, I've already said. It's the still small voice that we are choosing. No, on the outside, I can still look good and not listen to this voice. And that's superficial. And this is, this is, we've all been, this is the year of apprehending our destiny, right? Apprehending what we've been called to do. And he's telling us right now, halfway through the year, that all of us on some level are still suppressing his voice or mixing it with something else. And so there's a refining that he's wanting us to do right now and that the Holy Spirit is ready to empower us to do. He wouldn't bring us, bring this to us without giving us the power to do it. So I'm going to pray over us before Tisa comes back up. Holy Spirit, I just want to thank you for your fine tuning. We just say today that you have full permission to speak to us on any level. That includes our own personal correction about anything. You can speak to us on any level. We just repent right now for the ways that we have have suppressed your voice. We repent right now for the ways that we have mixed our own motives in with your voice. We ask for your forgiveness, Holy Spirit. We ask for your forgiveness, Jesus. Father God, we ask for your forgiveness for the ways that we have done this. And we recognize today what you're telling us. We hear what you're saying. And our response to this message will prove to you that we are serious about being refined. Thank you for telling us that it's all about love, that it's all about this overarching relationship that you want to have with us and with the other people around us. We're all God's kids. We're all God's children in this world and this nation. And we do not need to be arguing with each other over whether we should should or should not eat meat. We just say today that we hear you, that we could go back to the root of the problem, that we don't even have to engage our minds with all of the ways that the things in this world have become entangled, but we could go back to the original root of the problem and and transform and change our response to you, and that it starts with us. We can change the world. We can set the right momentum and the right, put things in the, in motion the way you want them to go by agreeing to yielding to you on every level, yeah. not just on the things that people see, but on every level. And so we say today that we will honor your voice. We will honor the way you speak to us, whether it's pretty or not. We will honor it. And we exalt you above all systems. We exalt you. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would hover over this word in people's hearts and in their minds in the coming days and that you would point out to them how this word personally applies to them. I thank you that you gave this word with each one of us in mind, that there's not one person in this room or listening on the streaming service that is not that you didn't have in mind when you released this word, when you called this to our attention. So we thank you for how much you care and that you will go to the ends of the earth and after generation after generation after generation to be reunited with your love, with the one you love. Thank you that that's us. And so we say we love you today. We exalt you. We exalt you, exalt you. We worship you. And we want to do all that we can to honor and bring honor to your name. You guys are going to have to chew on that for a bit. So go back and revisit it. There's a lot in there. Um, CC told us to remember this question. How much freedom of my expression do you allow on yourself? 
And I think, you know, giving is just a really practical way where we can see if we're suppressing the Holy Spirit or not. And she gave a really great example. Um, You know, and one of our goals is that we would get into a bigger building, but I want the Holy Spirit to be pushing out of this building before we get into a bigger building. And so we've got some room to grow in what we're allowing the Holy Spirit to come and infiltrate in this room and in our giving. Um, you know, one of the truths about us is that we're supposed to live an abundant life. So that's overflowing. And so I think we, we're we still um, experiencing growth in that. And so um, one way is that we, want, we don't want to suppress that truth. We actually want to live out of that truth um, and allow that to manifest in our lives. And so one of the ways we do that is in our giving. And so just practice it. I just test it. He says we can, you know, just, just go above and beyond. Ask the Holy Spirit, um, even before waiting, maybe for his leading, he's, he's already got things on in his plan that he wants us to give to. And so you can ask him. And so if you want to give today, we've got our box over there. You can put your cash and checks in an envelope, notate what you're giving. Um, we've also got our website. It's onelifeok.com. There's a place there that you can give, as well as we use Cash App, and our handle is dollar sign one life okay. So let's stand into our offering decree. Here we go. I declare 2021 will be a ground-shaking year. I declare it will be on earth as it is in heaven. There is no lack in heaven. There is no poverty in heaven. There is no fear of finances in heaven. Let it be so in my life and my tribe. I declare over this tribe that all God dreams are fully funded. I declare a release of heaven's resources to be distributed to this tribe. I declare I will be bold in my giving. I declare a new boldness in our tribe in giving. Let this year be the year heaven invades earth through me. Amen. So, Papa, I just say thank you for this word. I just bless Christy today. I just ask that you would just come and refresh her as she has been birthing this word for the past couple weeks. I thank you for the freedom that it is going to bring to you, Papa, that the Holy Spirit has free reign to roam about this house, to roam about this city everywhere that we go. And so I just ask that you would just implant this word in our hearts, that you would begin to identify those places that we maybe even unknowingly have been suppressing you, that you're going to bring them to the light so that you can be expressed to your full desire. So I just bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen.